Welcome to today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light. Sun, Salt, and Light, S-O-N, knowing and growing in your daily relationship with Jesus Christ, but also being the salt and the light in your marriage, in your family, at your place of work, at your church, and even in the community you're in. I'm Pastor Michael Petit. This is a radio ministry of our church, Calvary Chapel Divine, here in Divine, Texas. We are so glad that you joined us for today's broadcast. We are a Calvary Chapel, so we simply teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We believe that God uses His Word to transform, restore, and to change lives one verse at a time. If you're visiting our area, you'd like to get information about our church or church service times, maybe even track down some of the other teachings that we have available through podcasts, whether it's through Audible or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can do all of that at our church website at calvarydivine.org. That's calvarydivine.org. Well, good morning. Um, I think I'm going to, obviously I'm going to jump right in, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got right here, knowing I don't deserve to be here. Um, I was really great to listen to uh, Austin Carlisle's message on Wednesday. Um, I had a hard week, really. I was I was struggling with putting everything together on what I was going to teach, and uh, sometimes when that happens, I just I want to get fed, so I don't really jump right in and read everything. I just consume as much as I can. So, well, usually on what I'm going to teach, but it just so happened I was at uh, cheer practice with Ileana on uh, Thursday, and I had a couple hours, so I I went to the message since I didn't get to make it Wednesday, and it was about two hours long. <laughs> it was really long. Uh, it was uh, it was good that it was. I think uh, at one point Austin Carlisle said uh, I was just supposed to give my testimony, but you know everything happened. God really used him, and uh, and I really appreciated that because I think uh, it helped to give me some perspective, and uh, and then you know then thank God Myra uh, gave me some time on Friday. She helped me uh, step away from doing stuff at the house and the baby and the kids and and uh and I just was able to put it all together uh through God of course and a lot of prayer but uh a lot like I'm not going to get into everything from my past because a lot of it would be glorifying sin and I don't want to do that but uh when I was 17 my my brother died And I didn't flip God off uh, like Austin Carlisle did, but I did lay in bed that night and say, we go to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night. Every Wednesday, every revival, other churches revival. My dad's a deacon. My dad's a youth pastor. You know, all these things in the church. I love you, God. I believe in you. And this is what happens. I don't want to be saved. I don't want you. And I just, uh, for 23 years, it was a hard path. And and it's because uh, God was starting to reach me, and I didn't want him. And I didn't yield. And that's really what this message is all about is, you know, where, well, I named it really from the mire to the fire. Uh, where in the potter's house are you? Because it's not just the will, and that's your fault and my fault. Um, but I want to start it really with just by, I want to read it one more time. I know we did go over it, but. You know, praise God, we get to jump in anytime we want to now. So uh, Jeremiah, they call him the the weeping prophet, right? If you knew that, he was a crybaby. 
And he was a crybaby for a reason. Uh, he was a reflection of Christ. And he loved his people. He loved the nation of Israel. He served in Judah. Judah had sort of a type of revival, so to speak. It didn't take hold for very long. They began to turn away from, from God again. And Jeremiah's job as a prophet was to see what was going along, along uh, around him, what was happening, uh, hear the word of God about what he needed to relay to God's people. And Jeremiah was a little unusual. Uh, he was very visual. And I like that because I think men, especially, as slow as we are, we're very visual a lot of times. And we need to, you know, we look at a lot of times, you, they'll joke about it, you know, when you're putting together that uh, whatever it is, your kid's bicycle, the dollhouse, you know, whatever it is, we'll look at the pictures and we won't really read the directions. And, and God knows that about us, that sometimes we can be stubborn and we just get in our own heads and we, we're full of ourselves, right? So Jeremiah is the kind of prophet that would, and the messenger of God, that would walk around Judah with a yoke on his neck. And everybody's like, what in the world is this guy doing? You know, that belongs on an ox or whatever else. Why do you have that? It's because God gave him a message and said, hey, you are stubborn. And I want you for 40 years he did these crazy things in front of all of God's people to send a message because they were turning away from God. And uh, the, whole, the whole point of that is really, so it, the nation of Israel or Judah, specifically in this point, would take a look at themselves and ask themselves a question and say, where are you? Where am I? Where am I when it comes to my relationship with God? And it's an important question that we have to ask. And of course, you know, we remember in uh, Genesis 3, 9, when, when God walks into the garden and, and Adam and Eve had just committed the sin, they, they, they broke uh, one of God's rules. And God asks a very rhetorical question. He knows the answer, but he said, man, where are you? And it wasn't for God to answer to himself. He knew. It was so Adam would self-reflect and say, where am I? What am I doing? What is my direction? So as I was being fed this week, uh, I'm going to read this passage uh, right after this. I basically, if you guys remember Philip Keller, he wrote uh, the book, one of many books, but the one, you know, A, a Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. Um, he also has some, some, some sermons online. Uh, some of them are recorded. And as I was listening to various pastors that I have uh, that speak to me or, or that I feel like I can get God's message through, that they relate to me or I relate to them, um, I found Philip Keller's message about the potter. So I'm going to steal a little bit of his, his story uh, here, and I'm going to braid it into the message before we read uh, Jeremiah 18 again, let's just uh, have a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank you for allowing one of the foolish things of the world to stand in front of your people. I want to thank you for my family, my church, just for loving us when we don't deserve it, Father God. I want to ask that you help uh, deliver this message today, just speak your word through me, it's not me up here, it's not my message, it's yours. And uh, help me to remember that I'm nobody, except through you, I have value. Thank you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, and uh, Jeremiah 18. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my word. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled. Some, some, pa some uh, translations say marred in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. 
Um, you know, as we read this, I want you to recognize that as God is giving his message to Jeremiah, he's practically begging, pleading, crying, the creator of the heaven and earth, crying for you to let him work in your life. The same as he did for the nation of Israel. Um, I mean, we need to we need to yield to that. Or else you're going to find yourself in a lot of the other places that are... When I took a look at this, I realized, wow, there's a lot of places that the clay is uh, when it comes to the potter, which is really to follow our lives. Uh, Philip Keller tells the story of a time that he visited a region uh, known as the Khyber Path. And he was, I think he was, probably became a Christian when he was about 10 or 11 years old. He was pretty young. But he says, uh, I think in this sermon, that he spent about the next 30 years uh, doing what he wanted to do. And it took a while. You know, we're stubborn, so it took a while for God to, to reach him. And man, when he was allowed, when he allowed God to work and speak through him, it was, you know, it was really powerful. And his message is very clear. Uh, well, he tells a story when he's there. Uh, this, the Khyber Path is uh, like the northwestern part of Pakistan. It borders Afghanistan. This is a long time ago. My guess is it's probably in the 50s because he's born around, you know, the 20s. Um, and he was there really visiting a missionary. And the missionary comes to him one morning and he says, Hey, man, you want to you wanna go see? There's a, a potter here and he's pretty well known. It's kind of wild how it goes right along with the message, you know, do you want to go see him work? And, of course, he had never actually seen, I haven't either, I've never seen, you know, a potter do something from beginning to end and make something that's virtually worthless into something that, that has value that we would pay money for. Um, so, of course, he's, he's game. He goes down and, and he tells the potter, I mean, I'm, I'm so interested in what you're doing, I want to see everything from the beginning to the end. So the potter takes uh, Philip Keller to a little shed that's out behind his house or the, his little shop. And uh, it is separated from, from the house. It's in the back where the potter has, uh, you open the shed and it's completely dark. There's a pit that's dug inside of it. There's clay inside of that hole. And it's where uh, the, the potter tramps the clay to, I guess, increase the colloidal content so he can get the clay where it needs to be so he can work with it, so he can form, make something nice out of it. And, you know, what else is interesting is the Hebrew word for potter, uh, actually, it's the same as one who forms, one who creates, one who fashions. Um, and that, that is the name, the same name as potter. Um, in the story, or the word to Jeremiah, obviously we know that the potter is God. We're told many, many times throughout the Bible that he is the potter and we're the clay. Um, but as, as uh, Philip's telling this story, he, they open the door to the shed. It's dark. He says it stunk. It had a horrible smell, um, probably from everything that was mixed. It was separated from the elements because it needed to... Uh, be in a certain state so that the potter could work with it. He goes into the shed anyway. The The potter takes a little lamp and he he drops it down into the hole so he can see a little better. And then he reaches his long, he's an old man. Uh, he's been doing this for a very long time, but you know he has long bony arms and hands and he reaches down into that, that uh, hole and Philip Keller noticed immediately the kind of care that the potter took to fill around in the bottom of that hole in that pit in the mire um, to find the right piece, just the right clump uh, in that that dark, smelly hole, right? So it's important to note that the pit is far from not only the wheel where the potter sits inside of his shop, but it's also separated from the house. Um, I'm going to read uh, Psalm 130, verse 1 through 8. And this is David really 
we don't know whether it's where David was on the run from Saul because Saul had turned really from God and was trying to kill David, or if David was at a point in his life where he had sinned uh, with Bathsheba, and he just knew he was in a very dark place. And, and here uh, he cries out to God. He says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. And David, David does what needs to happen in the mire, in the pit. Uh, we need to cry out. What is a mire, if you don't know? Uh, it's not a word we use a whole lot these days, but the definition, the first, uh, the noun is a stretch of swampy and boggy ground. So you can see that it's not a, it's not a nice place. Uh, number two is probably the best definition that goes along with the passage. It says, a situation or state of difficulty, distress, or embarrassment from which it is hard to extricate oneself. It's too hard to get out on your own when you're there. We can't do it. But I want you to know it's, it's not hell. It might feel like it. It's dark and it's ugly and it's despair and, and all that, but it's not hell, but it's made to feel like it. And you might feel like it if you're there, but it's not hell. It's probably a reflection of hell, but uh, there's a good reason. We'll get to the very end of this, uh, the different places in the potter's house. Um, there's an action to every place that you, you find yourself, but there's also something that ties all of these places together, and, and we'll get into that here at the end. Um, so that's what the mire is. The potter reaches down into the pit. You know, he takes his time, and he pulls up the clay. Uh, I'm going to jump to uh, Psalm 40, 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog, set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our Lord. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So when God reaches down, uh, sometimes where he finds us is in that type of situation. And, uh, you know, in a pit in miry clay, he picks us out with great care from darkness, from maybe the despair of our old life, uh, the old person that we used to be. Um, that's what happened. So the, the potter in Philip's story, he takes the clay back inside his house to the wheel. And again, he takes really, really great care. He's even fussy, Philip Keller says, about making sure that that clay is dropped perfectly into the center of that wheel. And I think that's important because that's the only place on the wheel that we're supposed to be. That's where we belong. That's where Christ is. You know, we're, we're called to be Christocentric, which means at the center with Christ. And a lot of times we're egocentric. Uh, ego, of course, is the Latin word for self. So you're self-centered. And we've all been there. And it's easy to go back even when you are a Christian. But, you know, we need to remind ourselves that we need to stay Christocentric. So anywhere else on that wheel is going to cause a problem. Because anything other than the center is where things other than God are. So you can still be with God, but there are other influences. It could be work. It could be, it could be a temptation. It could be something inside of you. It could be something that's not even your fault could be something that someone's doing to you or has done to you that's pulling you away at, from that center. But the center is the only place that you belong. Um, a couple of examples could be something as simple as sports. You know, it's, it's, the, uh, it's football Sunday. And sometimes people are so focused on things like sports, whether you're in that sport or observing that sport, you wake up and you're checking those scores. What time's that game start? Man, why is this guy talking so long? I, you know, the the game starts here at 12 and and it's 12:10. I'm missing the beginning. This stinks. You know what I'm saying? Like it's something as simple as that can pull you away from being at the center. Um, it could be work. I'd have to raise my hand and say that I'm definitely there sometimes where. I'm constantly thinking about work even when I'm not there, and that's not a good thing. You have to be able to separate it 
Um, or actually, I probably should say, uh, pull that into the center with God and let God control work. And you don't have to worry about it. Just give it to Him. Social media status. You know, this is not really me. I don't give a dang about social media that much. But I know to younger people that it matters the way that they portray themselves to the world. And they don't, you know, it's funny. What was it? Court was saying to me, hey, I was in Walmart. And I was saying, you know, this and that. And my kids are like, Dad, don't. We're in Walmart. Like, stop. People are looking. But I think you get to a certain point where you just don't care. And that's really where you should be. It doesn't matter. It matters what where you are with God. It doesn't matter where you are with man. Uh, you want to be an example, but if you're centered with Christ, then you're going to be that example to other people. That's what's going to that's what's going to happen. It could be darker habits, it could be could be drugs, could be pornography. Those things pull you definitely from the center. So how do you become centered? How do you stay centered? Uh, Matthew 22, 34 through 37 tells us, Jesus actually himself tells us, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest of the first commandments. And the reason why is because that's what keeps you centered. The heart is your time, your talent, your treasure. Um, you know, the, the word tells us that a heart, the heart of man is deceitful. It will tell you things. And you'll think, man, my heart, I still feel this way. Or I, my heart this, my heart that. And we follow that. And uh, you can't. You've got to give that to God and let God control your heart. Give him your time, give him your talent, give him your treasure, and pray about it, and he'll give you direction. You don't have to get it from yourself, what you believe in your heart. Your soul, because that's your will. We are given free will. When we give that over to God, we follow his will. Your own will can get you in trouble. We're not slaves, and God didn't create us to be that way, and that's probably one of the most beautiful things about it, but it's also one of the scariest parts because we're really good at messing things up. Um, your mind because uh, your thoughts your actions they all, all everything begins in the mind and we need to give that over to God so he can help us to control our thoughts and our actions so love the Lord your God with all your heart your soul and your mind and that will keep you centered so crying out to God is the beginning of getting out of the pit the beginning of transformation uh, you can't be shaped in a pit. It isn't until God picks you up out of that pit, places you, centers you in him, in himself, uh, on himself, so he can, he can fashion you, he can work on you, places you in a new setting, uh, on a rock, on the wheel. So think about that. You have the mire, which is boggy, swampy, is not very solid. But the rock of God is. The rock of Christ is solid. And that's where he's trying to put you. He has to put the mud on the rock so it can be formed. You can't go on living your old life and expect to be centered in Christ. So in Philip Keller's story and in the passage in Jeremiah, the potter goes on to shape the clay. Uh, we know that it's marred. Uh, we know that it, uh, we know in the, in Jeremiah that it gets smashed down and reshaped, uh, made into something beautiful. But I think what's the point here is where God is crying, begging for us to be at the center of the wheel so he can shape you. So we don't let the things of ourselves get in the way or outside influences get in the way. And he's practically, well, he is, he's begging. It's not practical. He's begging you and pleading with you. The same as Jeremiah cries. Jeremiah was uh, a lot like Jesus, so much so that when Jesus said, well, who do the people say that I am? And some people said, well, some people say you're Jeremiah, that you've come back. You know, Jeremiah's come back and you're him. And what, what, a, uh, what a nice ribbon to place on Jeremiah that people say, wow, you are so much like Christ that now that he is actually walking the earth 
as man and God, that they get confused between the two. So God wants to make something beautiful out of us. Uh, in the story, Philip Keller shows us that, or tells us that there's, uh, when he's watching this potter, there's a bowl of water here and a bowl of water on his, on his right and his left. And as he's fashioning the clay, he, before he touches it, he puts his hands in the water. N he doesn't ever touch the clay unless his hands are moist with that water. Um, so he dips his hands in, and then his hands are never dry. He never touches the clay except through the medium of the water. So when God deals with you or me, he does so through the medium of the word. And that was the representation there. His hand is upon you, his hand is upon me, but it's never upon us, and it's only upon us through the medium of the word. So God molds us and shapes us by virtue of the word of God applied to our life. So there's another place that you can be in the potter's house, and it's possible that you've already been mostly shaped, um, that you're, you know, something beautiful that God made for for him but you but you know again we have free will and we always we don't always stay centered uh you can end up on the shelf and i'm really only speaking to a christian here um uh, you know a list a listener of charles stanley wrote him a letter once and said to him she said in one of your sermons you mentioned being put on the shelf what exactly does that mean how does it happen and if a child of god ever gets put on the shelf Will he someday take them off? And Dr. Sandley said, look, to be put on the shelf, it means God ceases to use that person. It's not because of him, it's because of that person. Sometimes it's for a period of time, and sometimes it's for the rest of their life. So when you choose to continuously be disobedient and remain in sin, God simply lets you put yourself on the shelf. And you're not being used. Well, that concludes today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light Radio. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to submit a prayer request or get in contact with us or find out service times, you can do all of that at our website, uh, as well as get uh, our podcast at Spotify, Audible, TuneIn Radio. Pretty much wherever you can find a podcast, uh, you, you can just type in Sun, Salt, and Light, and you'll find it. 